the rim. My original prediction, Celtics in six. The actual result, Celtics in four. Boston and Brooklyn was the most hotly anticipated series in the first round of the NBA 2022 playoffs, given that most teams in the East seemed like they would rather have not played the Nets. And that's fine, anybody with a lick of common sense did not want to see Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant as a first round matchup if you plan on having a long playoff run. However, the focus upon those two names is exactly why I picked Boston to win in six. The legendary shot making that they were capable of seemed to blind people to the flaws of the rest of the roster. The lack of depth, how they would score on what has easily been the best defense in the calendar year of 2022, and just overall how they matched up. Boston came out in game one and immediately set a defensive tone that was almost too aggressive and led to foul trouble, however, it was a sign of things to come. It was extremely difficult for Kevin Durant to get looks, even had trouble just controlling the ball in general. And so, while that did end up being a close game that the Celtics absolutely escaped with, it had a lot to do with the fact that Kyrie Irving went into a mode that we thought we would see more of throughout the series. His single-handed fourth quarter run very likely kept him from losing by double digits. However, when it came down to it, they had lost in large part due to one of the keys that I had to the series, this Nets team having to run two non-shooters at all times. Now, you can have a long argument on whether we should actually classify Bruce Brown as a non-shooter given that he ended the season shooting well and he shot well in this series, but regardless, it doesn't change the fact that Boston played him as a non-shooter. They left him open and they used that to show help. Given that he was routinely on the floor with one of Claxton or Drummond, it was simple enough for Boston to shrink the floor. Due to those facts, Boston was able to get a clutch stop, not call a timeout, and hit the game winner. Had they have not won that game, it could have been a very different series because they came into game two trailing. This was possibly the most unbelievable loss as they got everything they needed from their role players. The quote unquote non-shooter Bruce Brown, who actually led the run to start the game, and Goran Dragic. They combined for 41 points and if you were getting production from anyone else other than Kevin Durant and Kyrie, that's usually going to lead to a Nets win. That's mostly because you only need a little bit from one of Kevin Durant or Kyrie. Only that was the problem, they really didn't get a little bit from either. Irving was 4 of 13, KD was 4 of 17, and he also threw in 6 turnovers. Boston had a nice stretch of defense that changed the tide of the game, they were able to close and take a 2-0 lead. By this point, something extremely uncharacteristic had already happened. Kevin Durant had two terrible games in a row. Many of us who have grown up watching him have never seen him look so indecisive. I've never seen him not want to attack to the point that he's fumbling the ball. But you've got to look both ways. One at KD's struggles and the other at the Boston defense that caused those struggles. Anytime he caught the ball, he was harassed. He didn't have time to think about what to do. He didn't have time to read the floor. He didn't have time to make a decision. He was immediately met by physical bodies, active hands, and it clearly rattled him in a way that we hadn't really seen since Tony Allen in 2014. However, that in no way meant that the series was over. Without KD having posted a solid performance, they had still nearly won two games. There's a world out there where they went back to Brooklyn 2-0, just not this one. The thought was that eventually KD would find some type of footing and with home court, maybe we'd be headed back to Boston Tide. However, Game 3 was just even more questionable, and we should have known with the comments from Kyrie Irving that came after Game 2. There's nothing wrong with praising an opponent, but his comments about the Celtics window being now and this being their time, while down 2-0, kind of made it feel like the team was laying down, or at least he was. Jose Alvarado, who's a rookie, has known better than to praise Chris Paul while trying to stop him in a competitive series. So when Kyrie said that, it kind of felt like this was over. And as those comments kind of signified, they came into Game 3 like lifeless. The team had no energy, the building had no energy, yet we could only watch in confusion as this time KD was hitting some of the looks he was taking, yet he still wasn't looking for them aggressively. He was not asserting himself in the way that he normally does. There was even one possession where he flat out handed a grenade to Kyrie Irving instead of getting to his pull up that you would regularly see. This was yet another close game, but with KD only having posted 11 shots with 5 turnovers, they once again did not have enough to close even though you had Bruce Brown giving everything he could have possibly possibly given. As an offensive player that's ignored, as the guy that they play off of, you've got 26 points from Bruce Brown, in a regular world you've won. Yet the Nets did not. The most interesting part of Game 3 was Steve Nash finally unearthing Blake Griffin for a quick shot of energy. And while he did provide it, reality quickly set in. He hadn't seen a basketball court or enough of a basketball court in quite some time. So while he was a nice shock to the system, he was a target on defense. Which just spoke to the Nets' number one problem in this series. Well, maybe 1B or 1C. 
Either way, they just did not have the pieces to create the lineups necessary to close these games and to win these games. If at any point they had wanted to put LaMarcus Aldridge in, he would have been attacked relentlessly in pick and roll. They did put Blake Griffin in, he got attacked. You run Nick Claxton, he is also food for Jason Tatum. But on the other side of that, him being able to catch lobs every now and then was not enough to offset that poor free throw shooting, which actually wound up costing them game four. Yes, game four, another close affair. Finally, KD has a good game, making quicker decisions, looking a bit more like the Kevin Durant we've been accustomed to, but this was also at the point that the series was 3-0, Kyrie Irving had practically said they weren't coming back, and just like the first three games, Boston was eventually able to overcome them, and a guy that contributed to that who was expectedly absent from the series was Ben Simmons. He's not the player to just go out and win you games and change a series, but he could have changed some of the elements of the series, i.e. the Nets having to guard the Celtics' two best players with smaller ones. Many possessions you would have Goran Dragic trying to hold Jason Tatum, Seth Curry matched up with Jalen Brown. At the end of games, just as we thought they would, they would attack Kyrie Irving, and even though his activity on defense is good, he himself has just never been a good defender. Having Simmons to switch on to at least one of these guys could have helped. Without him, you saw Nash resorting to three guard lineups, which was a terrible idea against the Celtics team that was not a good matchup for them. And really, any lineup that Nash could put on the floor had the same weaknesses on defense and offense. Speaking of which, being that all these games ended close, one of the Nets' biggest problems was that Boston's role players did hit their open shots. Grant Williams shot 50% from three, Al Horford shot 60% from three. Both two of Boston's most important defenders and they played both sides of the ball. That was particularly important for Grant Williams, who was giving Kevin Durant just an entirely rough time. All in all, this was definitely a closer sweep than anybody will remember. Of course, because of the narratives and the slander, it will likely only be remembered that Kyrie and KD just had some of the worst showings that you could have possibly imagined for those two. But the Nets were often one shot away from the tide of the game being turned. Aside from just being a Celtics fan, I'm glad the Nets didn't go far because it does show the importance of the regular season. Guys need to be able to play together. The team needs to be able to Joe. We've seen it now with the Clippers in 2020. We've seen it with numerous rosters. You cannot just have people in and out the entire season, then put it all together for a playoff run. Kevin Durant was hurt. Kyrie Irving chose to be a part-time player. James Harden had to be traded mid-season. Ben Simmons never played. It was just entirely too much to put together at the back of the Eastern Conference for them to go on some massive run. But yes, admittedly running into the Celtics defense who matched them perfectly also was a very unlucky break. Now the Nets head into the offseason and figure out if Ben Simmons is ever going to play a game for them, if Kyrie is re-signing, and how to construct this roster so you can't load the floor up and basically make playoff wins depend on Kyrie Irving pull-ups. And the Boston Celtics await the winner of the Bulls and Bucks. I am covering the NBA playoffs on my podcast and the link in the comment section in the description, mostly on a every other day basis. And yes, I will, in theory, be creating videos like this for every series that happens. So if you enjoyed it, please hit the like button, comment, and sub. Also, hit the bell next to my name if you want notifications when the next one drops. Appreciate you all watching, and I'll see you on the next one.